This episode was sponsored by Girls Can Crate, a subscription box inspiring girls to believe they can be and do anything. Real women make the best heroes, and every month they deliver them. Hey, Olivia. Hi. Hey, last time, Hamilton came up, ah. the musical. And I've been thinking about theater ever since, because Hamilton is going on its national tour. Yeah. And so there's been like this frenzy to buy tickets everywhere. Yes, I was 167,000th in line. Were you really? Yes. <laughs> really? Yeah. So you didn't get tickets then? I did not get tickets. <laughs> <laughs> so Hamilton is the latest in a string of mega hit theater productions. Mm -hmm. I feel like it was like Phantom of the Opera, Les Mis, Hamilton. But what about there was Wicked, there was right. Rent. Yeah. How much do you think it's it's defining the generation of of youth who love this musical? Oh, hugely. Hugely, hugely. I think everyone my age, and especially at least all the theater kids my age, which is everyone my age that I know, um, <laughs> <laughs> Les Mis was like this critically defining piece of your childhood. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm wondering, because it feels like Hamilton has become a force yeah. in this generation. I mean, that March for Our Lives on Washington, mm -hmm. uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda was there. Yeah, you know, He was clearly, he was like the center of yeah. this new youth movement. Yeah. Do you think that theater has the power to shape who we are? Absolutely. And I think especially Hamilton is a good example, or Rent is a good example, that it it really did shift the way that we talk about things. I think that Rent shifted the way that culture talked about AIDS, that culture mm -hmm. talked about disease, chronic disease. Um, mm -hmm. We put the spotlight on different cool kids. Like we right. shifted our definition of who's a hero. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. There is still a huge segment of the American population who doesn't care about theater at all. You know, I guess who, <laughs> who never <laughs> seen or heard any of these shows. Who are these people? <laughs> what would you say to them? What would you say to the doubters to try to convince them that theater matters? Do you watch TV? <laughs> I mean, you know, we've shifted the medium, but there are very few people who don't care about movies. It's still theater. It's still people acting out stories that impact us. The woman I'm going to tell you about today, she believed profoundly in that power of theater. Hmm. She didn't just believe in the power of theater, though. She had to convince pretty much the entire country that it was a valuable thing. Mm. In the culture she came from, theater had never been a thing to admire. And in fact, in many places she went, people had never even heard of it. They didn't even know what it was. So she had to start from scratch. Wait, what? <laughs> wow. But the crazy thing is, they didn't just not understand what it was. In many places she was firmly condemned for doing such a thing. Mm. She was harassed. She was booed off the stage. She was called evil and wicked. She was attacked for trying to convince people that theater was a worthy thing. What? Because she was a woman or just because theater was unworthy? Well, both. I'm Katie Nelson. And I'm Olivia Mickle. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. So in some ways, this is a classic story of a rebel girl who believes in the theater, even though her parents tell her not to. Oh, yeah. This is the plot of many American movies yeah. that I can think of. It's perhaps even part of the American saga. We love those lone dreamers. Yeah. But this woman's story played out nowhere near America. Hmm. She lived in Russia. Aha. And she lived during one of Russia's most turbulent times. Is there like a not turbulent time in Russian <laughs> history? There I, are well, I wasn't aware that there were. Yeah. 
She lived in at the height of imperialist Russia. She lived through the Russian Revolution. She lived through World War One and World War Two. She lived through the Bolshevik Revolution until what? the USSR was established. <laughs> Her lifetime spanned all of those things. Wow. So this is at once a foreign tale, a very foreign tale, and a very, very familiar one. Hmm. I spoke to Danielle Ross. My name is Danielle Ross. Uh, I am currently an assistant professor of Asian history at Utah State University, where I teach the history of Islam uh, and also the history of women in Western and Central Asia. And she strikes me as a woman who also followed her own dream, because as an undergrad, she went to Russia on a study abroad. Wow. After she got her PhD, she ended up teaching at a university in Kazakhstan for years Mm. before she returned to the States. So she herself has had her own very interesting journey. Wow. But the woman that she told me about is Sahib Jamal Gazatulina. And she's a woman who is completely off the English-speaking world's radar. When she told me that we were going to talk about Sahib Jamal Gazatulina... I googled her Mm -hmm. and found nothing, nothing at all. She doesn't even have a Wikipedia page, nothing at all, this woman. So we're like way off the beaten track here. Cool. Sahib Jamal Gizatulina was born in Kazan, Russia, 1885. Now, when I think Russia 1885, I think imperial splendor. I think Tsar Nicholas II. But this isn't that Russia. Hmm. This is a very different corner of the Russian Empire, and it's one that tends not to make it into the broader Russian narrative. Okay, Sahib Jamal uh, Gizatulina is uh, an ethnic Tatar. There are two kinds of Tatars in Russia today, Crimean Tatars, who live in the Crimean Peninsula, and Kazan Tatars, or Volga Tatars, who live in central Russia, concentrated around the city of Kazan in what is today the Republic of Tatarstan in the Russian Federation. So the Tatars, who are today about 6 million people, they speak a Turkic language, they are Sunni Muslims, they're the largest indigenous minority within uh, the Russian Federation. That's where they come from. They're, They're there before this area becomes part of Russia. And the relationship between them and the Russian state has been up and down Uh, as the Russian government's views on Islam have changed and evolved over the centuries. Mm. Uh, The story we're going to talk about today with Sahib Jamal uh, really begins in the 19th century. It's 1907 in Russia, in the city of Kazan, And a young woman, 22 years old, she has just sat down in the audience of a strange new thing called the theater. (laughs) And it's one of those magical moments. She finds her life path and immediately after the performance, she goes up to the director and says, I want to join this theater troupe. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and that's a familiar enough tale. You yeah. Know, the, the young person who finds their fate yeah. and immediately they know what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. But in this context, in the context of Islamic Tatar culture, yeah. <laughs> this choice was bonkers. And this isn't just any theater performance. This is a performance by the first Tatar theater company. It's uh, founded by a man named Ilyas Kudashev Askazarsky. He's somebody who has studied at, there's some sort of hybrid schools in Kazan that are set up by the Russian government, but taught partially in Tatar. So he's had exposure to both Russian and Tatar culture. Okay. So starting in 1905, he tries to stage some bits of Gogol's Inspector General, Griba Yedev's Wolf from Wit, and he gets shut down before he even gets this off the ground. Mm. He tries again in 1907, gathers some performers, and from February to August 1907, these performers go to some different towns in the Volga region and begin to perform. Mm. 
And this is the company that Gizatulina will see. Theater had not ever been a part of their culture. So the, this performance that what? she saw was like this pioneering group who was basically saying, theater is a thing. Come and watch a performance on a stage. How and so can, the crowd would have... Wait, how, yeah. wait, wait. <laughs> yeah. How can that be true? <laughs> and this is wow. what makes her decision so crazy because you don't depict people in Islamic culture. Yeah. You know, only abstractions. Music is not okay. Mm. You, and you're doing both of those things on a stage telling a lie. It's a fake story. Yeah. And you are breaking gender roles. Wow. So, like, all of it is completely against everything Islamic culture says you should be. Yeah. And so no wonder they had never had theater. Like, yeah, there is no true. aspect of theater that is okay in the culture that she was raised in. And yet she goes wow. to see this performance. And even though it's breaking all the rules, she goes, this yeah. is for me. I have to do this. Plus... Even more radical, there are no women in the theater troupe to begin with. This is no place for a lady. Yeah. It was hard enough for um, Kudashev to get male Muslims to get on stage and perform. He figured there was no way he was getting women up there. Mm. So Gizatulina watches this, and it's beautiful right up until one of those female characters slash male actors opens his mouth, and the entire illusion is ruined. She goes up to Kudashev after the performance, and she says, you know what, I just loved this, but you men do not know how to impersonate women. <laughs> you don't walk like women. You don't talk like women. There's just nothing female about your male actors. It ruins the entire thing. So I and so that's just like, well, what do you want me to do? Like, I have what I have. She says, me. <laughs> I love this. This is what I want to do. Take me on, and I can start playing at least one of those female roles. Kudasha says yes. She goes home. Even though she's 22, she's still living with mom and dad. So she kind of has to explain herself to mom and dad. This does not go over well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's lots of yelling and fighting, but finally she wins out. Hmm. And they agree to allow her to pack her things and go off with the acting troupe. So she's in. She packs up. She leaves home and she goes off to join this wandering <laughs> theatrical troupe to pioneer the genre itself. Wow. Theaters are hard to fund and maintain today. Yeah. But back then, they were absolutely starting from nothing. Now, at this point, this is the first kind of official Tatar acting troupe, they are. They have no budget. They have no home base. They have no sponsors. So they're just a group of young people wandering around with, you know, some musical instruments, their suitcases and whatever props they can manage to, like, transport with them so this is kind of a scary thing she's doing she's not joining a well-established organization she's sort of <laughs> yeah. stepping out onto the street to see what happens not only did they have to get people to want to see a show and be willing to pay for it but they're also having to fight for the value of theater itself yeah so they're constantly attacked constantly condemned uh, everything they're doing is Wicked, you know, not only wow. do people not approve, they also don't even know what it is. Like, why would I want to go and see people move around on right. a stage doing <laughs> something that's not true? Why on earth is that possibly interesting? Wow. So it's a constant battle just to feed themselves. The biggest problem that these people face is money. And Kudashev is, perhaps as an artist and an intellectual, very talented As a financier, he is absolutely <laughs> at a loss. <laughs> at one point, they're going to travel to Moscow, and they have to buy train tickets for the entire troop. Kudashev comes up to Gizatulina, and he gives her her money for her ticket, and she says, here, use this, buy your ticket. And she says, well, what about everybody else? Oh, I already took care of everybody else. So they're all getting onto the train, and the conductor comes around and starts checking tickets. <laughs> and suddenly... Everybody in the troop, except Kudashev, Gizetulina, and one other person, bolt. <laughs> yeah, they hide wherever they can. 
and gets to Tim Linder realizes that none of them have tickets. <laughs> and so they just sort of snuck everybody else onto the train. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, once they get to Moscow, they don't have money for a hotel and they're walking around trying to find a place to stay. Uh, and this creates a lot of stress. So they're so desperate. And they're really not making any money at all because nobody cares. Nobody cares. Yeah. And they're certainly not really going to pay money to go and see something like that. Wow. Um, so Gizatulina is funding the whole theater troupe often by selling her own jewelry. Wow. Once she runs out of jewelry, she sells all her dresses. She's just, she is pawning everything that she ever owned in order to keep the theater troupe going. Jeez. Early on, Gazatulina scouts out a guy. Uh, he's an unlikely actor. Gabul Karayev. He is a, a student from the madrasa. The madrasa is um, a seminary for training Muslim clerics. His specialty is that he is a Quran reader. Hmm. So it, it, theoretically, at least, he has a really good voice. Kudashev, the head of the, the troop, takes one look at him and just goes, Oh, no. Huh. Just You don't look like an actor? You, you don't move like an actor. You are not going to be in my troop. And so Karayev kind of walks away, hanging his head, looking very sad. And Gizetulin now intervenes. And she uses her influence with Kudashev. And she says, hey, he really wants to be here. And yeah, he's a total unknown. But Tatar theater doesn't exist. So we're all unknowns. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you take a chance on him. Maybe he'll turn out to be okay. It's worth it. Uh, Karayev... Is not great starting out because you keep in mind he's coming out of this madrasa culture where you kind of sing spirituals and read the Quran. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of a drag on stage. He closes his eyes when he recites. Yeah. And Kudash is kind of losing his mind. And Kuzatulin is just like, no, just give him some more direction. Keep working with him. <music> Ultimately, Karayev and Kuzatulina become friends. And so they formed this kind of unlikely partnership. Hmm. We don't know if it was love. We can't really be sure. We don't know any of the details of their relationship. But it certainly was a partnership. We could at least call it that. Hmm. They're traveling all around. The money problems get worse and worse and worse. And eventually this explodes into a showdown. Uh, Kudashev has some money, but not much. Everyone else is out of money. There's a conflict over who's going to pay for the room. And Karayev, who Kudashev didn't want in the troop in the first place, calls out Kudashev on the fact that there's no money. We're going to get thrown out of our hotel. And Kudashev is so angry, he's like, I'll show you. And he goes out and calls in the uh, landlord to throw Karayev out. And there's a scuffle in the courtyard. This is all getting ugly. And Gizetulina finally steps in. She's like, you know what? I have a ring. It's my grandmother's. But it's got to be worth something. Take the ring. She gives it to the landlord. This should be enough to cover our room and board. Let us stay. Wow. But that fight between Kudashev and Karayev is the straw that finally breaks the camel's back. Hmm. And the other actors get together because they saw how Kudashev essentially was ready to throw everyone else under the bus. Mm -hmm. Uh, in order to maintain authority in the troupe, and they collectively decide to throw Kudashev out of his own drama troupe. And the parallels here to the Russian Revolution, mm. to me, are blaring. Collectively, the actors are throwing out their inept, oppressive mini-czar, wow. who is trying to control everything they do and where they go, but he's not doing it very well, and yeah. so they overthrow him, and they kick him out. At this point, Karayev and Kukizatulina take over as the new sort of co-heads of the troop. Hmm. And now they're going to try to succeed where Kudasha failed, which is ma actually making money in Tatar theater. So thanks to their own mini revolution, they're all in it together now. Hmm. They traveled around a whole bunch trying to find willing audiences, but eventually ended up back in Kazan. At some point, uh, another one, someone else involved with the troop, Kamal, uh, Gal uh, Galeaskar Kamal, tells a story about how they're supposed to be staying in this sort of inn. They don't have money to pay for their rooms. And at some point, they're able to work out a deal with the owner that, okay, we'll, we'll sing in the evenings and perform. Hmm. And in return, you'll feed us for free. 
So literally they're singing for their suppers to sort of keep this troop moving. A lot of them have sort of left their families behind them. You have instances where somebody's really sick, they can't afford medicine for them, they all have to be out on stage performing. And so Gizatulina will run back at the intermissions in order to check on the sick colleague and make sure that he's still okay and has everything he needs. Banded together, they become a family. Wow. And now let's pause for a word from our sponsor. Girls Can Crate is an awesome subscription box that introduces girls age 5 to 10 to real, fearless women who made the world better. Every crate features an inspiring woman, a 28-page activity book, plus everything you would need to complete two or three hands-on STEAM activities and more. So when I first heard about these crates, I thought they seemed really cool, but I have to say when my kids got their first crate, I was genuinely amazed at how awesome it was. It really exceeded my expectations. But today, we're also doing something exciting. Our exciting giveaway extravaganza! <laughs> we're giving away a free Girls Can Crate this month to one of our lucky listeners. For details on how to win, go to whatshernamepodcast.com and click on the giveaway link. The contest ends on April 30th, so make sure you enter right away. What's Your Name believes that real women make the best heroes, and every month, Girls Can Crate delivers them. Girls Can Crate, C-R-A-T-E, dot com, and use the code HERNAME to get 20% off. It becomes like a family in a good way and a bad way. In a good way that they will often look out for each other, in a bad way that they also have these very bitter conflicts with over money, over performance. We don't really know what happened, but Karayev. That's her partner guy. Mm -hmm. Karayev and she had a ugly falling out. Mm. Karayev is absolutely enraged. He tells her she can't go because she's part of his troop and he's in charge and he'll do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. And she's just like, I'm not afraid of egotistical men. <laughs> just say whatever you want. I'm packing up. I'm leaving. And he promises her she will never perform again anywhere in the Russian Empire. Wow. Uh, and she'll never set foot on another stage. And he will see to it. And it's, I'm sure she's kind of going, yeah, you can barely feed yourself. I mean, <laughs> how worried should I be about you? Huh. So she leaves in this very ugly sort of falling out. She started her own new troupe, and she called it Nur, which means light. Hmm. And I think that goes back to that educational aspect of drama, is that they they talk a lot in the early 20th century about bringing enlightenment, ending night, ending ignorance. Well, she saw it as kind of this mission. I am going to travel around Russia using theater as a mode for cultural change. Huh. She seems to really have believed in the power of theater to shape culture. So I feel like she would look at our blockbuster musicals today <laughs> that have a real powerful effect on our culture and she would be like, yes, I knew it. I knew it was yeah. going to work out. And so she was actively using the theater to say to people, you know, to show them models of how to be. Huh. Years have gone by at this point where she's always just barely making enough to survive, barely has enough money from pawning her belongings to keep oh. the thing going. But she, she persists. She keeps going. Uh -huh. And... I think the, the clever thing that she finally did eventually was bring in the youth. In the city that they set up in, they mm. recruited young people to help them. Uh, one, because young people are cheap. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the young people also helped spread the word. And 
uh, as youth are prone to do, they were very interested in this new edgy thing. Huh. Uh, and they weren't nearly so close-minded toward theater. And that is finally when theater took off for them. Oh. They, they had the young people with them. That makes my that makes my former theater major heart happy. I was like, <laughs> she has to catch a break. And by now also, she's as she moves into the 19 teens, she's still acting, but she's taking on more and more of the responsibilities of a director rather than an actress. I mean, things are looking really good for her. Things are oh, no. really settling in. Oh, no. Yep. <laughs> 1917 happens. Oh. The Russian Revolution. Uh. I mean, it's real upheaval. They weren't anywhere near Moscow, so it wasn't like, you know, that there's chaos in the streets or anything like that. Mm. They really just heard, they would have heard word, the Tsar has been overthrown. The royal yeah. family is gone. The empire is over. The government has completely collapsed. In her little corner of Russia, they mostly were just desperate to find some government bureaucrat who would give them the permits they needed to perform. Mm. But there were no bureaucrats around to give them their permits. <laughs> so it seems like it maybe took a minute for it to set in. Like, no, the government is gone. It completely yeah. collapsed. And then I think they realized that this kind of chaos could be their big moment. That yeah. this wasn't just destruction, but it could be great opportunity. They decided to stage a famous, very nationalist Tatar play. Mm. A play that sang the praises of the Tatar state and huh. their culture and the greatness of their heritage as opposed to Russia, right. which was something distinctly other. Russia was Christian. It was their invaders. It was their oppressors. Yeah. So they thought, well, here's the moment. The, yeah. the government has collapsed. Here's the chance. You know, I imagine a modern parallel would be if Washington, D.C. collapsed and Texas seized the moment to become its own country. Yeah. Oh, man. So believing so much in the power of theater, they were like, let's do it. We got to go big. This is the moment we have to <laughs> stage the biggest, most epic, powerful play ever. And that will get the people on board. It seems like the cause was great enough that it actually brought her and Karayev back together. Hmm. They joined their theater troops together in order to stage this spectacular play. They hire somebody to write an original score wow. and bring in a full orchestra to perform the score. So this is a huge shift. And in part, this, they're building off of this, the euphoria of 1917 and what's going to happen next and freedom. Mm -hmm. they're, but they're also building off of the institutional chaos that nobody can tell them they can't do these things. Right. They want to see, at very least, equal rights for people across the empire, regardless of ethnicity or religion. From Gizatulina's point of view, although we don't think of her when we like talk about the Tatar sort of women's activists, yeah. I mean, she is almost certainly pushing also for equality of the genders. So was there, there, must, there was this moment there in 1917 when it looked like... Anything can happen. So they're like, this is our chance. Now, if we can get the Tatar people all together, we can finally, at the very least, demand equality from Russia, if not break away completely. It didn't work. Yeah. Nothing ever came of it. Oh. Russia, meanwhile, decayed into civil war, where there's lots of different groups vying for control. Right. And in the chaos, as all these different groups and their armies are moving across Russia, vying for position, trying to claim territories, she is accused by the White Army, which is um, the imperialists, mm. of being a Bolshevik spy. Ugh. Does she end this story with no head? <laughs> No, <laughs> actually, she fares quite well. All right, and that's good. kind of what that makes it interesting. <laughs> and immediately they zero in on her, oh. and they say, "You are a Bolshevik spy. You are a communist. You are red." So she joins the Bolsheviks. <laughs> <laughs> 
It probably didn't take much to push her over yeah, the edge. I mean, that probably was it. She's like, oh, if you're, if I'm already guilty, ah. well then fine, I'm gonna do it. She joined the Bolsheviks, and and they said, wow, well, you've got a real talent for theater, and we could really use that. We could use the power of storytelling to share our message. Mm. She will go into the ranks of the Bolsheviks, mm. and she will set up the theater or theatrical brigade within the sort of emerging Bolshevik Red Army. Wow. And they will go actually out to the fronts where the Bolsheviks are fighting, and they will put on theater performances. Oh, wow. To kind of say, here's our message. Yeah, here's, here's who well, we it's, are. again, it's kind of two purposes. One is just entertainment, right? Yeah. Because you have all these people that are out fighting. They need something to do when they're not fighting. Mm. But it also is a propaganda device. And that's sort of the really ex probably most exciting part of her life. Eventually, when the Bolsheviks finally take over and then that turns into Soviet Russia, mm -hmm. she manages to weather all of those political storms and she became a great theater director for the Soviet Union. Wow. For the rest of her life, she was operating theaters and sharing messages up until 1974. Wow. What a time to live through. Wow. In, in British history, there was this phrase which was often cited in the religious wars hmm. that um, either you are sprung from the willow or the oak. <laughs> the willow tree is bendable. It can move with the wind. It can shift with the time. So if you are sprung from the willow, you're a flexible person. You know, whichever way the wind blows, you can go with it. Right. But if you are sprung from the oak, then you are firm and brittle. You cannot change your mind. Mm. If things change, you will not bend. You'll break instead. Mm. So she seems to be sprung from the willow. Yeah. She was very able to shift with the times but at the same time you know when she joined with the bolsheviks nobody could see what they were going to become yeah and at the time given her options in russia the whole nationalist the tatar nationalist movement had collapsed so that wasn't gonna work anymore so her options were join the white army join the bolsheviks and and at the time, the traditionalist monarchist side was super chauvinistic mm. and super racist. <laughs> and the Bolsheviks were preaching, well, not just in preaching, really enacting and embracing real equality for all the races. Mm. And they were all about gender equality. Mm. In, in the moment... The Bolsheviks had these really great ideals. Yeah. But then the way it panned out just didn't quite work out that way. Um, one thing we have to understand about this period, too, is people don't see where the Bolsheviks are going. Mm. You know, we know we know what happens by the 1930s. People in 1917 to 1922 don't know that yet. She wrote her own memoirs, but her story kind of peters out after the 1920s. Mm. But we know that she lived until 1974 working in the theater. So this is one of the things that Daniel Ross is going to try to look into and uncover. Go to wow. Russia and try to find more evidence of how her life actually panned out. Yeah, how fascinating. I guess in some ways I feel connected to her as a woman just because there are so few women in the field that I study. Ah. And it's not that, again, it's not that they're not there. It's just that they've not been included into the narrative. Mm -hmm. And so there's a sense of talking about the women en masse. And this is what reformers wanted to do with women. Yeah. These were the problems women were facing. But we get to men and it's like, yes, Kabbalah Tukai did this. Yeah. You know, and Amarhan did that. Right. And so it, I was, I'm drawn to her in one way that you can see a woman actually doing something and living her life and dealing with the same political and social questions that the men are dealing with. Mm -hmm. And so I think there, I mean, I feel a sort of bond with her. You know, she's really willing to do anything to make this work once she sets her mind to it. Mm. Uh, also a person who is very independent. 
you know, she will not take nonsense off of men. Mm -hmm. And she's living in a society that's very patriarchal, so this is something that she has to put up with regularly. Right. And she would rather part ways with them, throw them out, rather than compromising or in some way diminishing herself in order to please them. Hmm. Uh, she also cares a lot about all the people that are working with her. Hmm. And you could see her working very hard, not just to get the theater to work, but to make sure those people are taken care of. So she really treats these um, actors like they're her own family members, if not her own children. Hmm. So she seems to be a very warm, caring person in that way. Hmm. Warm and strong. But, but also very strong. Well, I mean, it's, but you know, as a woman, you can be strong, right. independent, but also nurturing at the same time, right? <laughs> yeah. You don't have to sacrifice one. Right. But she's very much, you know, she's the manager, and to some extent, she seems to be the mother to all those people in that troupe. And wow. in that way, she does become sort of a parent in addition to being a boss wow. for these people. What a cool lady. <laughs> If you want to learn more about Sahib Jamal Gizatulina and the Tatar Theater, you're going to have to wait until Professor Ross writes her book. <laughs> Special thanks to Danielle Ross and her husband who provided all the wonderful Tatar folk music for this episode. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith, who also recorded the interview on site. You can follow What's Her Name podcast on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of relevant pictures each week. What's Her Name podcast is produced by Katie Nelson and Olivia Mickle. And if you want to help make more episodes of What's Her Name happen, click donate on our website, whatshernamepodcast.com. Thank you. Oh,